Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank the uh, organizers for inviting me to speak here today. And in particular, I'd like to thank them for um, having me speak at the last talk of the last day of the, uh, of the conference. I I'm actually serious um, because um, uh, I actually followed some amazing talks earlier today that were tremendous lead-ins for the point that I'm going to make. In fact, the very point that I'm going to make in my title because we saw that throughout the talks today, um, there's this tension. On one hand, we have systems like Autograd, which are amazingly convenient, um, and you can use in extremely powerful ways um, to formulate some incredible kinds of uh, computational methods. Um, but we also saw in that very talk that there are performance um, deficiencies in Autograd, and that um, for one of the particular examples to uh, circumvent that uh, performance um, deficiency required uh, going underneath the hood and, uh, um, and implementing something in Cypon. On the other hand, we saw um, systems like XLA that are amazing, generate code with amazing performance, um, but um, they're much less convenient to use, and I think the talk on Autograd uh, gave a whole lot of examples that would be tedious and difficult to code up in something like uh, um, XLA or TensorFlow. And uh, this tension between uh, convenience and performance is something that has existed in the field of AD for a very, very long time. And it's the subject of Barack and my research for the past 50 years to try to narrow the gap between uh, the two extremes. And so let me give you a first day a very, very a quick overview of forward mode. Um, as Brock pointed out, historically, forward mode was invented uh, before reverse mode, um, though in this community, because of its um, exposure to back propagation, a lot of people are more familiar with reverse mode than with forward mode. Um, but I'm going to put them both in the same framework and I'll elaborate a little bit what Brock showed earlier. So we can think of a function just as a composition of primitives. You can think of F1 to Fn as what we call machine state transition functions. They take a machine state as input and produce a new machine state as output. And the program ultimately consists of running a sequence of instructions that uh, transform an input machine state to an output machine state. And if you want to compute the Jacobian of that program, uh, you could do it by the chain rule and you get the product of the Jacobian of the individual machine state, state transition functions. But since those functions are all sparse, they all look at only a small number of memory cells and update a small number of memory cells, all of the Jacobians are sparse. And so um, this matrix multiplication is, in, in a sense, a very, very sparse matrix multiplication. Um, but the matrix multiplication, if it's not sparse, since it's over the entire machine, it's uh, very, very large. And so what we do is we compute the product of the Jacobian with an input vector or a tangent vector to get an output tangent vector. And this leads to the following implementation mechanism. Since you see over here, um, each stage of the Jacobian computation has to use the value computed by the previous stage of the computation. You have to interleave the computation of the original computation with the computation of the um, accumulation, what's called the forward accumulation rule of the Jacobians. Um, but as a consequence of this, once these variables are used in the next step, they're no longer needed, and they're therefore no longer alive, and they can be reclaimed, and you only need to keep the state around for each individual uh, uh, intermediate computation as it's being pre preceded. In contrast, in reverse mode, we have the same um, program, but we're going to compute the transpose of the Jacobian, which is just the product of the transpose of the individual Jacobians um, in reverse. Um, and we're going to multiply it again by a vector. In this case, it's a cotangent vector to get a cotangent of the input relative to a cotangent of the output. But when we implement this, we see that since um, the first stage uses the last result computed by the program, and the last stage of the Jacobian uses the first result computed by the program, you have to first run your program forward, and then you have to compute the uh, cotangents in reverse. And that requires that this entire piece of information here be stored so that it's available for use over here um, during the reverse phase. Um, and we'll see 
ways that we can simplify that a little bit. So if we want to implement forward load by load, we essentially have to take this piece of code. And what we're going to do, as Barack showed, is we're going to implement a transformation where normally each individual primitive operation takes an input and produces an output. What we're going to instead have to do is it's going to take as input a pair and produces output a pair of what we call the primal value and the tangent value. And so this results in a very, very simple transformation that we apply to the program, where every variable in the program gets replaced with a variable that holds two values instead of one value, um, both the arguments to programs or functions, the return values of functions, um, the intermediate values of functions, the global variable, everything just gets overloaded so that it holds pairs, what we call dual numbers, and the functions get overloaded so that they do this computation, the original computation plus a, a Jacobian vector product here. Now, the simplest way of doing this is simply defining a structure which is classically called a dual number or a bundle um, that holds uh, the two uh, numeric values. We um, save the original value of the addition operation and we're going to overload the addition operation with one that computes both the primal value of the addition and the Jacobian vector product. In this case, it's very, very simple, but we would do the same thing for every primitive operation in our language. And what constitutes a primitive depends upon granularity. It could be just addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. It could include um, uh, math.h. It could include numpy. It could include more. It could include less. That's just a question of what the granularity of your primitives in your language are. And then, to compute a derivative, in this case, actually the directional derivative of the function at a point, we form a dual number of the point, and uh, in the scalar case, it's a unit, in the uh, non-scalar case, it would be some, some vector, direction vector, which could be basic vectors. You run your program, and then you extract out uh, the tangent field. If you do this, you run into a problem. Because I've hardwired my addition, to always do this overloaded operation, I can no longer run my original program without taking a derivative. This has the advantage that this is a very, very fast operation. But if I want to be able to both run my original code without taking derivatives and run my code while taking derivatives, I have to put a dispatch in here to say, if my input is a dual number, I'm going to do my modified computation. Otherwise, I'm going to do my original code. And herein lies the first source of the tension between convenience and performance. Because if I do this, it becomes convenient. I can run my code both on original values and to compute derivatives, but I have a dispatch that has to take place at every primitive operation, and that hits performance. Well, there's a problem with this, which is that um, this code can only take first derivatives. Suppose I want to take high order derivatives. But then what I could do is I could, over here, instead of calling the original plus, I could make a recursive call to this and allow dual numbers to be nested inside other dual numbers, to have a tree of dual numbers that bottoms out in some real numbers. And then if I did that, um, I have, can have a second order derivative operator which forms a tree of, of two deep of dual numbers, put it into my function, and then get out a particular piece of that tree to get out the second order derivative. But now we see the second source of tension. Because over here, I could have just, if, if I would have done a little bit of flow analysis in the program, and would have determined that the input to the program here is a dual number, I could have done some specialization at compile time and implement either this branch or this branch at any particular call site uh, to this function, and then compile the way of this dispatch. But now if I have the ability to run derivatives of any order by allowing my data structure to be recursive, I no longer can compile away the, um, the, the operations for the higher order uh, derivatives here. 
So if I want to achieve that, I can do yet another um, um, alternate implementation. I can do what I call a stratified implementation. I can implement level zero versions of the primitive, which just do addition. I can implement level one versions of the primitives, which um, do operations on trees of depth one of dual numbers. I can do level two implementations that um, do trees of depth two um, to do second order variables and follow on. And then in order to use this framework, I actually have to have multiple copies of my entire program. I have to have a copy that's all written in terms of level zero so that I can run my program without taking any derivatives. I have to have a level of my program that's rewritten so that all of the function calls to all the primitives use um, the level one operators if I want to take first derivatives, and I have to have a whole other strand of the program, the whole other copy of the program rewritten so that all the primitives um, use the level two functions if I want to take second derivatives, and this goes on even more if I want to do um, higher order derivatives beyond second derivatives. Now, this might be done manually by the programmer. It might be done automatically by some piece of the implementation. Um, I can go even further because here the um, level one and the level two are written so that they pass around these data structures, which usually are allocated in memory and are passed around by pointers to those memories. I can actually do an operation called unboxing, where instead of passing around a pointer to a data structure, I pass around all of the slots of the data structure itself. And that works for almost all programming languages for input values. If I want to pass out unboxed output values, I have to have a programming language that is powerful enough to allow me to return multiple values from a function call in an unboxed fashion. Some languages allow it, some don't. Um, but I could do that, and then I can unbox all of the primitives for all of the different strata in the um, implementation. And then all I have to do is, in a given call site for a given strata of my code, um, inline this code, and then I have compiled away all of the indirection in memory access to access the components of the slots. I compiled away the allocation of the uh, tuples used to store the data structures, the, uh, the compiled away any reclamation that results in garbage collection of intermediate um, uh, dual numbers, and compiled away all of the dispatches. So each of these different strategies for implementation have existed in different existing AD systems that have been developed over the past uh, several decades. So um, one of the earliest um, straight overloading approaches to forward mode was a package called SkiNoodles, uh, which actually never appeared as a separate entity. It was an appendix for a textbook on classical mechanics called Structural Architecture and Interpretation of Classical Mechanics, and it's the code base that's used uh, to develop the ideas in the textbook. And the basic ideas are that they have um, uh, dual numbers and um, they overload the operations of addition, uh, primitive operations, and then computing a derivative um, just creates a dual number, calls the function in, and extracts out the derivative component. Um, and that works because you can do things like this, um, and take the derivatives. Um, there were issues involved in taking derivatives of derivatives, and over the years that have been worked out in a number of different incremental stages, and we have a paper that, we actually have two papers that detail the machinations you have to do in order to get this uh, to be correct. Um, and this is very, very convenient, but for all the reasons that I mentioned before, it's extremely slow. It's slow because of the need to do dispatches, it's slow because you've overloaded the operations both for when you're taking derivatives and when you're not. Um, you can solve that problem by doing local overloading or temporary overloading of fluid let um, and do that. But that has uh, other difficulties because accessing these fluid bindings is um, slow. At the opposite end of the stream, there are systems like Adafor and Tapanad that have been around for uh, several decades that operate as source-to-source -source transformations that are run as preprocessors to the compiler. And they implement one of the other strategies that I, that I discussed. So, for example, if you take a function f as input that computes this, you run it through a 
preprocessor to get another piece of source code, GF, um, that computes um, the, um, the forward mode um, variant of F. Now, in order for this to work in Fortran, because Fortran doesn't have any way to indicate um, which function we want to take the derivative of, and um, which functions are, which inputs, what are the values that are inputs and outputs, oh, I should point out, this is fast, because obviously this is just code that runs, um, but it's inconvenient, because you have to tell it in a separate file what function you're taking the derivative of, what the independent and dependent variables are, um, and it unboxes in here, but notice you can unbox the um, inputs to a function in Fortran. You can't unbox the outputs, so one of the, so there's this asymmetry that results in that um, the tangent of the output is passed by side effect to an argument rather than by being returned as a result. Um, and then if you want to take the derivative of that, you can go here, but then quirky things happen because notice there are two values of gx here. One of them results from the tangent of the primal, one of them, the other one results from the primal of the tangent, and so there's name conflict. So how you deal with that is you have to tell it to name the variables differently in the different strata of the differentiation, um, and fine. Another system that has been developed is FabBad. Um, this essentially is um, autograd for C++ that was developed in the 90s, um, and you take a program like this, um, and you have to manually rewrite it with different types. Instead of double, you implement it as an overloaded type of double or a, a forward bundle or a three member bundle. And then if you want to get a second derivative, you have to do f of f of double. Um, and this is very, very, very slow. Um, why is it slow? Because while this is a, um, a built-in primitive operation run on the CPU, um, this is a method call uh, that has to do dispatch, and this is a method call to a method call that has to do dispatch. Um, and it's also inconvenient because you have to change all of your type declarations in your program to this and to this, and you have to make copies for all the different strata, um, and uh, you have to do it for all of the input arguments to functions, all of the results of functions, all of the intermediate variables, um, and you can try to do this in somewhat of an automated fashion with templates. The only problem is the vast majority of code that exists out there is not written in this form. So if you want to use some off-the-shelf piece of code to take a second derivative of or a third derivative of, you have to either do this manually or rewrite the code um, to use this templatized style to make it amenable to automation. Um, and even if you did that, there'd be different APIs for accessing the different components of the different structures to get out the uh, tangent components. Well, this gets even worse in reverse mode because um, this is a um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is an eight-line caricature of Autogram. Um, this is essentially what FabDAV does in reverse mode. We have a data structure traditionally called the tape which is just a direct and asynchronous graph that has three values, three slots, a value that's being computed by the primal, an operation, and its arguments. You save the original value of the function, and you overload the function so that when it inputs a tape, you create a new tape, which has the addition of the values of whatever the primitive operation is on the values, the name of the primitive operation, and the list of arguments. And if it's not a tape, you just do the original operation. What this does is when you run your program, what comes out at the end is this big DAG that represents the entire floating point computation of your program, and then you do whatever you want with that. You could do back propagation on it, you could do some other mechanism on it, um, uh, but the crucial part is uh, this overloading operation that creates a representation of the floating point graph that's computed by the program. And the problem with this is that the size of this data structure is now proportional to the running time of your program. So you can't apply this method to programs that run for very long. So you can go back to the original mechanism here and see what's really going on. What we really want is we want to compute the forward phase, compute all of the values, and then we want to run the reverse phase after we finished here, having access to the uh, saved values. We don't actually need the tape. 
We only need the values. We only need those values that actually happen to occur over here. So we can do various kinds of static analyses to keep track of which values are going to be used during the reverse phase. So let me show you an example of how that's done. This is an example I did by hand, but this is what uh, a state-of-the-art system like Top and Knob would do, is you take a, a piece of input fragment code like this. This is something that just computes an L2 norm. Um, and the crucial thing here is that um, I've written this only four times south to show that um, all, all of the arguments and results are passed indirectly um, by reference to the arguments here. And what we have to do in order to allow, we're going to call this code, and then this code during the forward phase is going to call these, this code here twice to get the square. And then when we're going to do the reverse phase, we're going to run this, the, the tangent code for this in return, and we're going to need to run the tangent code for this in two different places over here. And when we do that, we're going to need to know the value of, of um, of, uh, I, don't know, I put this on, this should be okay. We need to know the value of this variable. So what we have to do is we have to instrument the forward phase to save the value of the variable on a tape, what it's called. Um, and um, the reverse phase over here um, acts as and then the reverse phase has to pop it off. So now, what you notice over here is I've manually applied some optimizations to this because I know the structure of this code and the smart compiler would do so as well, to know that the only thing I need to save is this one variable. I don't actually have to save the entire DAG for the entire computation that's being performed. And that's what happens in practice for real programs. And for real programs, you just have um, a straight line code that computes the uh, Jacobian vector products for the uh, reverse sweep that's taking place. Um, and to answer the question that I've heard floating around um, a lot is how do you handle conditionals and loops? Well, what you can do is in the forward sweep, if your code had a conditional, you would just save the value of the antecedent to that conditional on the tape. Um, and you take a branch to different pieces of the original code to compute different portions of the, of, of, of the uh, to run different portions of the code. And in the reverse sweep, you would pop the value of that uh, branch, of uh, uh, the branch variable off the tape, and you then branch the different portions of the tape that would compute the different Jacobian vector products of the different uh, portions of the primal. And systems like Tapanad do that. So the question is, how can we have our cake and eat it too? How can we get a system that's both convenient, has the power of something like Autograd, is expressive with something like Autograd, has the nice feature that it is a one API system, that all you have to know is one function, um, and yet it achieved the performance of something like XOA. And what I contend, and this is the research that Barack and I have been doing for 15 years, is that we want to migrate source to source transformation from runtime compile time with abstract interpretation or partial evaluation. Now let me show you how that works. So a traditional source-to-source -source transformation system, what the user wants is to compute the derivative of f of 3. And he's got some function f that calls g and some function g. And what he's going to do is he's going to pass this into a source-to-source -source transformation of preprocessor. And he's going to translate that by hand into something like this. It's going to call f forward on 3 and 1 and get back out the primal and the tangent and use the tangent value. And then, because he needs this function f forward, he's going to pass this through the transformer and get that. And because this needs g forward, he's going to then pass this through the transformer and get that. And depending on how powerful the transformer is, it may or may not figure this out itself based upon whether it has access to the call graph or not. And depending upon whether the call goes across a modular boundary or a file boundary or a compilation unit boundary. Um, what we want to do instead is this, where we have a function, and we provide a new fundamental API as part of the implementation of the underlying compiler, the underlying programming language. We have a procedure called code that you can pass at runtime a function pointer or a Python function or a scheme function or whatever. And what it does is it returns the source code for that function at runtime. 
And then we implement our source-to-source -source transformation as a function in the programming language that takes a representation of the source code either as a string or a cell data structure and produces a representation of the transform program either as a string or as a data structure. And then we have another procedure called compile that takes that representation at runtime and compiles it and links it in and gives you back a function pointer. So if you had these an API that provided these three things, the way you can have both convenience and performance is, well, you also need to think to get the call graph so you know how to take the derivatives of everything you access. Um, you implement a derivative is um, you loop over all the things that are called by the function and you access their code and transform them and you compile them. And then you take the code that you want to call, access it, um, transform it, compile it, and then call it on the dual number and get back the tangent and return the tangent. So that's all very nice because it gives us the API, like Autograd, of derivative. It gives us the benefit of a source-to-source -source transformation system um, like uh, Tapenad or Adafor. There's only one problem. What if I do this? I'm doing gradient descent, right? Gradient descent. And I call my derivative in the inner loop. Well, then I'm going to be repeatedly accessing the code and compiling and whatever, and I want to avoid that. So how can we make this efficient? Well, um, the problem is more general than that, which is most modern programming languages, in particular systems like NumPy, um, do overloading for lots of numeric operations. So we have scalar addition and vector addition, um, and we have some nice high-level primitive called add, which if it's a vector, does vector addition, and if it's scalar, it does scalar addition. Um, and this allows you to formulate a whole lot of generic operations where you don't know whether you're passing in vectors or matrices or some other arbitrary data structure, sparse matrices, um, and allows you to formulate generic algorithms that are data structure independent. And then you come along and you want to do some addition in, uh, between scalars and another addition between um, some more complex data structures, and you're going to have this dispatch over here. So what you can do is what's called flow analysis, sometimes called polyvariant flow analysis, sometimes it's called abstract interpretation, sometimes called partial evaluation. And you symbolically evaluate the program at compile time. Instead of putting in the actual numbers, you put in these types, double, and then you flow it through to here, and then you specialize add and make add one, and then specialize to double and double. And you flow it through to here, and then you determine that this is true, false, at compile time. So you peel that away and you get that code, and then you can then inline it back down over there, and then since you know scalar addition is really that, you can further inline it down to that, and turn this into one machine instruction. And then down over here, you pass in that you know it's an array, you pass that into there and specialize it to another variant where you pass in arrays, and now you pass an array over here, and then it's true, and then you get this variant, and then this gets copied down over here. And so now we get specialized code over here. What this allows you to do, among other things, is that you can have data structure allocation, i.e. allocation of dual numbers, um, and access, accessing the slots of dual numbers, and partial evaluate that away to that. And if you do that, you eliminate storage allocation, and storage reclamation, and storage writes into the slots, and storage reads out of the slots, and get code that you're not using, um, and um, it's very, very, very powerful to do this. The, ca the catch is this might cross a function boundary. It might actually even cross a file boundary. And so you have to do this over the entire program in order to get the efficiency benefits of this. But this is needed because the way people write code today, the way, people, the way NumPy is written, the way people use NumPy, they have all sorts of powerful abstractions like map and reduce, and they write code like this, which basically does a dot product, um, mapping multiplication over a two to a tensor and then um, summing it up. If you apply the techniques that I showed you before to this code um, aggressively, you compile it down to that, and you get nine machine instructions, four multiplies and five adds. But if you don't, 
you have all of this overhead of function calls and looping variables and accessing data structures and, um, and indirection into memory and allocation, allocation of new variables and garbage collection when they're no longer used. And so if you really want performance, the kind of performance you get out of um, XLA and TensorFlow, you have to do this transformation from this to this. So you need this anyway to compile dynamic languages efficiently. And the punchline is, the same mechanism can support AD. So everything I've shown so far has nothing to do with AD, but AD can be added on top of this simply. And the way it's done is that you can take a piece of code like this, instead of passing in a number or an array, you can have an abstract function, particularly it's a function f, and you specialize derivative one and pass in function f there, and pass it into the code, and then at compile time you get the source code for f, and then you transform it at compile time, and then compile it at compile time, and you get another piece of code over here, and then you call it over here. And so what we've done is we have this very powerful reflective mechanism that has a tremendous amount of overhead. By having a very aggressive compiler, we migrate all of that reflection from runtime to compile time. And what ultimately you get is the convenience of writing something like Rotograd, but the speed of using the system like TensorFlow or SLA. Okay, so it's a single powerful optimization. And the crucial thing here is nothing about this optimization is particular AD, it's a compiler optimization. Um, and it allows a simple formulation of AD transformations. The, we built a big system, it's something like 30 or 40,000 lines of code. Most of it is the, that flow analysis and inlining and specialization and code generation. There's a total of 28 lines that implements forward mode and 155 lines that implements reverse mode built on top of this um, 40,000 line code infrastructure. And the tape, crucially the tape in our language, is implemented as a data structure. It's implemented in our case as a closure. And we have to be able to handle closures anyway because we want to handle the full language. So that means we have this closure property where the output of the transformation is in the language that the transformation can support. So um, to add on to something the other event folks said, in order to get closure, you not only need to be able to provide um, the uh, Jacobians for all of your basis primitives, you also need to be able to transform every construct in the language and whatever your language is, whatever those constructs are. And in our case, the crucial innovation, the, the fundamental innovation, is that our compiler basically uses the lambda calculus as its intermediate language. It macro expands or de-sugars input language to the pure lambda calculus, and we have a closure property on lambda calculus. That's the crucial result. Um, and, many, and as a result, since we're just operating lambda calculus, Many optimizations from the AD community, like deciding what things to record and what not to record, is just a question of liveness of variables. It makes it easier to get it right, and it makes it easier to get it to nest, to be able to transform, transform code. Um, so here is the actual code for forward mode a system, um, and here is the actual code for reverse mode a system. I won't go into the details, but the crucial thing here is this line over here. What this line does is it says, you have a function that takes x as input. You have a whole lot of single assignments and temporary variables, bindings, let bindings, and it returns the result of y. What you transform that to is x that takes the transform value of x as input. You run the primal code in the same order. Instead of returning a y, you return a pair of y and the lambda expression that takes a cotangent for y as input runs the transformations of all the bindings in reverse from 1 to 1 and returns a contention to the output. So we have the self-similar property that every function in the system returns both its value and what we call a back propagator. And the back propagators are all just linked together through closures, so you call the back propagator on the result that you get and you get the gradient values. So let me show you some powerful things here. The autograph folks showed some powerful things, but the crucial difference is that all of the powerful things that the autograph folks showed were built on top of NumPy. And they all 
got reasonable performance because they used NumPy primitives. I'm going to show you some things that are not going to be based upon any standard library, so providing derivatives for them is not going to help. So if we take this classical two-person zero-sum game, instead of um, uh, optimizing, doing this discrete optimization over um, uh, pure strategies, we're going to assume we have continuous strategies and we basically want to do a minimax optimization on some payoff function, um, in, which is basically computing the saddle point of this function. So we can write it as this code here. And the essence here is we're doing a, an optimization over a function that does an optimization over another function, f. Nested optimization. Each of these is going to, this is going to take the gradient of this to do gradient descent, and this is going to take the gradient of this to do gradient descent, so it's doing nested optimization here. And this code, we can actually run in both forward mode. We can have each of these two optimizations, this be forward mode, this be forward mode, this be forward, this be reverse, this be reverse, and this be forward, or this be reverse, and this be reverse. If you were to do this in autograd, having both of these be reverse, you get tapes built out of tapes, and it'd be a very, very complex data structure, and this operation would be very, very slow. I'll show you the speed for this in a moment. Another simple example that involves nesting is, suppose I have a cathode ray tube that the um, electron gun over here is emitting electrons, and I have a deflector electrode over here, and I can change its position, and I want to change its position so that the electron beam um, intersects the origin. Um, so I have some physical system that models how this um, electron moves. Basically, I do an integration of the energy function, and then I'm going to wrap it in um, a minimization of the error of how far off I am from the origin when it hits. So I have a, an optimization over um, a numerical integration procedure that solves the, um, the ODE. And again, this can be written over here. I have a uh, ODE solver over here, and then I take the um, derivative of this ODE solver, which does this derivative process, which in itself involves a gradient to, um, uh, to relate the potential function to the energy. Uh, a third example I'm going to show, I'll show the benchmark, is suppose I wanted to make a probabilistic programming language. Suppose I have a program, a very simple program, that says if x equals zero, if x zero is true, then return zero, else if x one is true, return one, else x two. Now suppose I sample x zero and x one from some random variables, um, some, some really random variables, and then I can compute what the probability of um, observing each of the possible values is as a function of the uh, parameters of these random variables. And I can say I observe four runs of the program, and I can compute what the, what the probability of observing this particular four runs are. And then I might want to do a maximum likelihood estimation to determine what are the values of the, of the parameters of these distributions that um, maximize the likelihood of observing um, these four variables. Um, same thing I could do, the same thing in Prolog, where um, I have a a prolog program, and I put some distribution over the presence or absence of clauses in the program, and uh, uh, observe some queries, and uh, um, uh, again, um, marginalize the probability of observing those queries, and then ask what's the value. So what I can do is I can actually write an evaluator for scheme. And here's the cat. I want to show you the evaluator. It's a straightforward evaluator for scheme. I can take my evaluator, I can take my probabilistic program, feed it into the evaluator, take the probability distributions that I put forth as the uh, values of the bindings of the variables x0 and x1 as input to the evaluator. And then I can um, compute the result, um, I can let this be a type distribution, compute the result of my observations, and compute the joint probability of the observations. The crucial thing is I can wrap this whole thing in a lambda expression and abstract these parameters as parameters to the lambda expression. Feed this into an optimizer and take the gradient through this symbolic evaluator of this program that's evaluating um, this over various probability distributions uh, to get the maximum likelihood estimation of parameters. And I can do the same thing for a prologue program. 
I can take the Prolog program and I can feed it into a uh, theorem prover and uh, put in the uh, observed queries, compute the, um, the, the joint probability of the observations and uh, wrap it all in a lambda expression, uh, expression and um, uh, abstract over the three parameters of the distributions and then do gradient descent over that. Notice here, neither my theorem prover nor my evaluator for my programming language are going to be primitives in NumPy. This is going to ultimately have to bottom out in just some built-in capabilities in Python or Scheme or whatever. And so there's going to be a tremendous amount of overhead of taking derivatives of all this. Yet, if I put this into our system, what we get out is straight line numeric code. No data structures, no allocation, no reclamation, no indirection, um, no, uh, uh, no dispatching, no nothing. Just straight line numeric code. And you gotta believe it's gonna run faster than everything that's gonna have a tremendous amount of scaffolding involved. So here is an example. This is just running straight back propagation on a um, two level um, perception training on exclusive work. These are all normalized to our compilers as unit runtime. These are implementations in Fortran, and in C, and in C++, and in ML, and in Scheme. All of these systems here, um, the ML, the C++, the ML, Haskell, Scheme are autograd-like implementations. Um, the Fortran and C implementations are tapenade and Adafor-like implementations. The Existing state of the art is about an order of magnitude slower than our method. And the autograd like implementations are about three or four orders of magnitude slower. And if you look at the uh, particle and satellite benchmarks, the same thing. The uh, um, Adafran Papanod style implementations, the one that do source to source transformation, are about a factor of five slower. And the um, ones that do autograd are anywhere from two orders of magnitude uh, to four orders of magnitude slower. And if you look at the um, ones that involve symbolic manipulation as part of the inner loop of the optimization, the probabilistic programming examples, uh, we didn't bother writing this in Fortran or in C or C++, it was just too difficult. But if you do it in ML and Haskell and in Steam, um, you see that we're as much as five orders of magnitude faster. That's the potential of this kind of technology. Um, so to summarize, um, you can have your cake and eat it too. You can both get a convenient system as well as a performance system um, if you integrate AD into the compiler. It's not a library package that is um, loaded into an existing system. And that compiler has to be very, very aggressive. It has to do things that um, achieve this, like uh, doing partial evaluation or at least flow analysis, abstract interpretation. And if you do that, you can formulate AD as one of many different compiler transformations that you have to do anyway in order to get efficiency for like the uh, MapReduce example that I showed. And then if you do that, you get essentially what appears to the user as runtime AD, but has the performance of compile time ID through a source to source transformation. Thank you. So there's a specific question 
and a general question. The specific question is take up of our tools as we have written them. The more general question is take up these techniques and employ these techniques and other tools that people write. Um, let me address the specific one first. Um, I am a researcher, I'm an academic, I'm a professor. Um, I, um, my goal is to publish um, and not necessarily to produce and release code for other people to use. So that's just not been a high priority for me given my career goals. Um, the question of whether these techniques are generally, generally suitable, um, the fundamental issue is that this is all based on partial evaluation. Partial evaluation is a concept, an idea that has been around for um, several decades at this point. And the fundamental question is how to tame it. Because if you apply it blindly without any control, without any restriction, you get um, a tremendous amount of code specialization and a tremendous amount of growth in the code. Um, and the, the open, unanswered area is automated techniques for deciding when to partial evaluate and when not to. And I think the, the sort of forefront areas of that are doing that through a combination of static analysis and uh, runtime profile, profiling. And I think that's, it's by no means easy. You can't just take these techniques and employ them and make a production system. It will require some um, novel innovation in order to um, to answer the question of where to partial evaluate and, um, yes. So, um, it's not so much a set of axioms. Um, we have an API, which is you have to be able to access. It's not just partial evaluation. You need, reflection, you need reflective partial evaluation. So you need a mechanism that can access um, uh, the source code associated with a function. You need to be able to access the call tree of a function at runtime. You need to be able to compile a function from source code to an executable at one time and link it in. And you have to be able to partially evaluate through those primitives. If you have that, and your intermediate language is the pure untyped lambda calculus, we have the axioms for how you implement forward mode and reverse mode for the pure untyped lambda calculus. If you want other things that are not in the pure untyped lambda calculus, like a type system or like side effects, then our axioms don't address all of those issues. That's an area for future research. 